Aloha, my name is Julie Mitchell, and I am the Executive Director here at Kuikahi Mediation Center. Welcome to our Finding Solutions, Growing Peace Brown Bag Lunch Series. We are one of five nonprofit mediation centers in the state of Hawaii, and we serve East Hawaii. We were founded in 1983, originally as a program of the Island of Hawaii Y MCA, and in 2006, we became our own independent nonprofit organization, and we are celebrating 41 years this year. Our mission is to empower people to come together, to talk, and to listen, to explore options and to find their own best solutions. To achieve this mission, we offer mediation, facilitation, and training, like today's brown bag, to strengthen the ability of diverse individuals and groups to resolve interpersonal conflicts and community issues. Our Brown Bag Lunch series is held every third Thursday at 12 noon on Zoom, and you do need to register on Eventbrite each time to get the Zoom link. We are excited to announce our next Brown Bag Talk, which is on June 30th. The speaker is Arliss Dudley Cash, and she will be speaking on the topic, Unlocking Effective Communication Through Disc Personality Types. So if you're interested in learning more about that, it's kind of like a Myers-Briggs or the Thomas Kilman conflict styles. And I will put a link in the chat about that talk and then the, the Eventbrite link to click on and you just pick the correct date to sign up for that. At the end of our talk today, we are gonna ask you to fill out a short online survey and that helps with our grant funding for this free series. When I put the survey link in the chat, please do take a moment to click into it and give us your thoughts. We will also be sending an email out later that's gonna to include today's slides and also a one sheet handout that Paula arranged with all the key concepts in her talk, a video link and the survey link because we know some people have had problems clicking on the survey in the chat box. So we give it again as an email. Without further ado, let me introduce our topic. Elevate the conversation. Who can? You can. And our speaker, Paula Thomas, who is a communications professional, writer, yoga teacher, and student of spiritual evolution. Paula has spent the past several years studying and working with spiritual teachers and, more recently, political strategists who are about using body language, listening, and compassionate inquiry to find pathways to peace and self awareness in everyday encounters. Doing this work is about promoting deeper, more meaningful, and heartfelt relationships. Please join me in giving Paula a warm Zoom welcome. Take it away, Paula. All right. Thank you, Julie. Let me just get my slide show up. There we go. Can you see my screen? Not yet. You've got to share screen. Okay, hold on. I'm, I'm, um, I'm technically. Just give me a moment. No worries. We can, we can give you a moment while you are getting yourself set up. We practiced this earlier, so I'm confident you can do it again. So you just want to hit. The <laughs> you just want to the 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 There you go. Okay, yeah, and then you just want to go play from the start. So if you see the very left hand play from the start, that's what you want to choose. Hold on. See. See over on the far left. There you go. That's it. That's the one. Okay, wonderful. Perfect. You got it. Yay, success. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So I, I welcome everybody and um thanks for being here. I have a lot of material that I I want to cover. This is my first time doing this kind of presentation. And I wanted to share a couple of, of thoughts with you before we, we jump in. First of all, why did I do this? Um I wanted to do this to help you improve the depth and breadth of the conversations that you have and to give you tools and tips to develop ways to develop more connection, trust and comfort in your conversations so you can move towards things like persuading other people if you need to admonish somebody or give them a warning. And these, these kinds of things are the uncomfortable aspects of communication, but we can do them in a way that protects ourselves and helps the other person and doesn't lead to conflict and um, discord. So you can do this without being harsh, without being triggered, without being forceful. And of course, you're going to be more effective if you converse in this way. So with the, I'm going to provide 10 tools and tips. There really are, 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 are several more that are, that are important 
in elevating a conversation, but I distilled this for this for purposes of this presentation, the, the 10 most important things that are, 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 are for you to practice. Consider these things as tools and things that you can experiment in your day-to-day -day conversations and find out how to tweak them, how they work for you. Um, and there's an inner and an outer component to communication and to the things that I'm offering you. The outer component is dealing with the words and phrases that people actually say. And the inner component is paying attention to your feelings, your instincts, your alerts, like, oh my God, I don't, on the questions you have as people are talking to you so that you can act in service to what your intention is with the conversation. Um, we always have some reason for engaging in a conversation, but have you, do you think about what your intention is when you engage with somebody? Like, what do you want to get out of the conversation? And that's why my first, my first phrase is about beginning with the end in mind, but in setting attention for conversation doesn't have to be like having an agenda. It can just be something as simple, like I want to, you know, catch up with my girlfriend who just came back from a trip, or I want to reconnect with my son who, you know, I haven't spoken with for a really long time. I need to know what's going on with him. It could also be, I need to, I need to have a, a face to face with somebody who I don't, I, I've had a, a, a disagreement with and I need to kind of clear the air and get back to some stable foundation or get back to some kind of a, a relationship. Relational um, relationship with him and an open relationship with him. So, and it could be a behavior problem, could be anything. But the, this talk is intended to give you an overview, as I said, of the tools and awarenesses that you can develop as you're having conversations so that you can, in the course of communicating, deepen your relationships and connection to another person. Um, and it's also intended to support you in creating something like a meaningful, a beneficial, a heart-centered, connection-building relationships because that uh, communication is about relationships. So I'm gonna address some actual language issues here. We're, we're gonna talk about what you can do as the speaker, what you can do as the listener. And I want to remind, remind us all that we are each of us responsible for everything we say. And once you say something, you can't, unsay it, right? And, and the other person can't unhear it. So words matter, words have meaning, and um, they're really I I I important. And it's it's also essential to, to choose your words carefully and be sure that you are always saying what you really mean. And that's easier said um, than done. The last thing is that um, the undercurrent, underlying foundation of this elevate the conversation is about your being aware of yourself and what you're feeling while you are in conversation with somebody else and to understand how those er undercurrents are acting upon what you say and how you respond and even if you're listening to the other person. Um, okay, so on that note, I wanted to talk one more time about, one, one more point about the importance of of developing the muscle to pause. And that's one of my tools. And I wanna talk about it a little bit more right here, right now, because um, moments moments in conversations happen when moments, moments of uh, anger or triggering or the emotions sort of flare up unexpectedly in conversations. And it's important to understand that those are times or signals for you to allow a pause. And a pause, this is like the inner part, the bodily part, embodying the conversation with yourself. So when you're, when you're emotional in a conversation, we don't necessarily take the time to pause, but we don't take the time to experience the discomfort either. We want to just get rid of that feeling of awfulness and like, oh my God, I don't feel good about myself or I'm really angry or I'm uncomfortable. We want to ignore the negative feelings. And part of how you elevate the conversation is to not, not do that. So on that note, I wanna move in to the, the presentation. Thank you for letting me have that introduction. So we're gonna begin with the end in mind. This is not a Paula Thomas original thought. This is from Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You wanna begin with the end in mind and that's about setting the intention and knowing what you wanna get out of the interaction before you enter into it. Set your intention and to manage the flow of your conversation for whoever it is, whatever it is, even if it's just to have a giggle session with your friend, right? You want to have a giggle session with your friend, 
and that's your intention. So knowing that is so very valuable. Okay, the first tool and tip is to track and listen, okay? So tracking tracking and listening is about, um, about stopping if the temperature goes up, like you're tracking the conversation and you're listening. And as soon as you feel that something is not right, you're going to stop. And if the temperature starts to go up and you start to feel a little agitation, and then you're going to settle yourself down. And I use this stop and track and listen. It starts with stop because it's the great railroad analogy, right? You're in a railroad crossing. It's a potential danger zone. So you stop, you look, and you listen. And so the analogy is in a conversation, if something starts to feel a little off, you're going to stop, right? And then look and listen. As the conversation moves along, one of the things is that your job as the listener is to track the conversation, to pay attention to the connection between the statements, to make sure the details support the person of your conversation and 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 you're you're following along. You have permission if the logic isn't there or you're missing some detail, you're not understanding how one person connected one thought to another, you're you can say, hey, I don't understand this. Can you, can you, I don't understand your logic here. Why does this, why is this related to that? That's the intervene when necessary piece. The other thing you want to do when you track is you, um, you want to make sure that you understand why someone is telling you what they're telling you. Sometimes people go, are in a conversation and they're going off into a story and you're not sure why that information is coming your way. And it's important to like just listen, but also if you're tracking and you're not clear or you feel weird about what's going on, just say, hey, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but why are you telling me this? Like, why do I, what do I need to know this? And let them tell you what the connection is. That's just so valuable because it keeps you, it, it keeps a listener knowing that you're paying attention and it keeps you from wandering with well, your mind wandering off and not not really listening and thinking about something else so pay attention to the connection make sure the details support what you're doing and a lot of times people will be inconsistent in their stories to you so in the beginning of the conversation to say oh no i really love doing this and i doing i love really going there and i appreciated this thing 10 minutes into the conversation somebody's going to tell you the absolute opposite so if you're tracking it's also your your kind of responsibility to say, wait a minute, I hear what you just said, but you also just told me that you don't like that. So I'm not I'm a little confused. That's what tracking is about. And it's it's very it's a little tough to do. And it demands that you are fully present in the conversation, which is another piece about the awareness, having awareness when you're in conversation with someone else. So the other piece of this track and listen is the listen part. Listening is a skill and a practice. And we're not a culture that listens very well anymore. There's too much coming in and we tend to like sound bites and then go off and, you know, move along. But if you're really listening in a conversation, it requires that we all like slow down and you're, you're, you're comfortable really paying attention to the words and the tone of the other person, that you wait until the other person is finished speaking before you intervene so you're not talking over somebody else. That's, a, that's not only respectful, but it's also uh, Im important for the completion of the conversation. And then when you're listening, it's, it's good to parrot what someone, is, what someone has said to you to confirm that you've heard what they say. And the wait until the person is finished speaking is important because a lot of times what happens in conversation is somebody says something and we get a response in our head about what we want to say. And we hold on to that thought that we want to share. And we don't really listen to the rest of what they're saying. We wait till they're finished speaking and then we address the thing that they said three minutes ago. And that creates a disconnect in the conversation. So listening really means also kind of keeping your mind open to everything a person is saying and not getting so caught up in what you want to say back because you're going to miss, you're going to miss what else they're saying because you're holding on to a thought and you're stuck. It's like you're watching a video that's five minutes long and you're stuck on minute 301 
because uh, you want to address something there and you miss the rest the other two minutes of stuff. So that's the track track and listen piece. And um, moving along, I want to talk about kind of word. This is a word thing. Avoid absolutes. So certain words that we use inflame and trigger in conversations, um, and they'll contribute to the toxicity in a relationship or even in the very interaction. And so in my slide, I say, here are a few words and phrases to avoid and remove totally as a pattern of your speech. Like, you always do this. You always tell me that this and then you, and you never listen to me. You make me feel so angry when you do that. I hate it when you, so when you're, what you're doing with these kinds of language, we're labeling people, you're so selfish, you're so cruel, you're so something. When you start a sentence with you, you're putting a person in a box and framing it and sticking them there as though that is your fixed perception of them and you leave them nowhere to go. And what is somebody going to do if they feel sort of boxed in or put in a corner? They're going to want to fight back. They're going to want to defend themselves. And they're going to, often you give us, well, will you do this too? Or you do that too? And now you're at a very low level in your conversation. And what does this talk about? It's about elevating the conversation. So to keep the conversation on a, on a higher level, you don't ever want to use the accusatory words, you never, you always, you make me feel, you do this. You start the sentences with I. I'm really bothered when you do this. I don't appreciate it that it seems you are, you. when I come in, you're, you leave the dishes on the countertop. It happens too many times. Like there's ways you can rephrase what it is you want to say that isn't accusatory, but it rather you're conveying your negative reaction to someone else's behavior and you're taking complete ownership of your own feelings. Okay. So this is, these are, it, it's kind of a simple thing, but it's really important. So anytime that you find yourself saying you, the, you, this, you, this, stop yourself and rephrase the words. So you let the person know what you're really feeling and what bothers you. Now, there's no guarantee that they're going to change their behavior because you've shared what you felt, but now they can't unknow what you feel. And if they continue to do what they're doing, then you know that they're not really respecting your, your attitudes or behaviors. That's a whole other thing to deal with, but it's not going to be a point of contention because you've made your statement and you've let the other person adapt to whatever it is. And so to relationship build, you want to address the fact that maybe, hey, I did express to you that I don't like this and yet you continue to do it. Can you tell me why? So now you're not fighting. Not, you're not fighting, you're not arguing, you're not being angry, you're just seeking explanations, motivations, and seeking reasons for, okay? And that's where language becomes super important. And you actually can, you actually can shift the way a person responds to you if you address these, if you address your complaints about them from the I perspective. In the same way, um, when you label people with with words and adjectives that are negative, um, they may just decide that, okay, that's how she feels about me. I'm just going to, yeah, sure, I'm selfish. Yeah, sure, I'm stubborn. Yeah, sure, I'm an ass. I'm an, I'm an ass. And um, you've just invited spite and retaliation. So these are things that you do not want to say. And you do not want to label other people. You want to talk about the behaviors and actions that give you a negative feeling. And you talk about your negative reaction. Okay, does that, is, I hope that's pretty clear. I don't want to um, belabor the point, but it, this can't be, uh, can't be overstated. The next thing is pause, which I alluded to before. So I don't know how many of you are comfortable with suddenly being silent in a conversation. But I, for myself, have found it a really powerful tool. When someone has said something to me and I feel I feel accused or I feel um, like I've done something wrong, the first thing I do is notice that my stomach 
starts to get a little bit contracted and I'm starting to feel, oh, I've been, I've just, I'm in the doghouse. And the, so I just sit with that feeling and decide how I want to handle that because I don't want to fight back. And I need, I know when that happens, I need to find out just what is going on with the other person. So um, I ask for space if I feel the slightest bit testy or defensive or angry. I'm like, okay, I'm not cool right now. I got to figure out what the next thing I need to say is. And sometimes if you can't calm down right away, take some deep breaths, let yourself settle, scan your body. And is, your, is the, is the, is the clutch in your throat? Are you uncomfortable in your heart? Is your, is your, is your stomach gritting? You know, calm, are you, are you, are you um, holding on your, your gut because, you know, you feel really, you know, I feel really ill. That per that comment made me really sick and I feel really bad. And then give yourself decide, give yourself time to decide what to say, be authentic with your feelings and say, hey, that made me feel a little bit like I did something wrong. Is that what you're is that what you're telling me? Or I'm not sure why you told me that. Why do I need to know that? So you 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 can shift the conversation into something more meaningful by not reacting to the the tense, the tenseness, but by cutting the tenses by asking for more information. And you do, you can only get there by pausing, making space. It's like making virtual space between you and the other person. Like, okay, I need to take a moment. Same way if somebody tells you something, like maybe you're arguing with your child and they're, they're yelling at you and you want to yell right back. Now, they've just charged the air with all this negative energy, this sort of attack energy. And there's no way that you're, you're not going to feel that. So... What you want to do is just make space and just not react. Let that person, you know, let that person go on and on and on as much as they want to without you taking in personally what they're saying. And sometimes, you know, you've been in conversations where, you know, even on television, there's a line, da, 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 are you done yet? Are you finished now? Like, have you vented everything else you want to say? Is there something else you're angry about that you want to share? So in a way, you're just giving somebody an invitation to do more and you're letting that, letting that, hot energy dissipate before you before you react now the other thing that that the pausing is really important for is when you're feeling angry and upset about something someone else is is doing in, in as you share and you got to figure out why you're feeling triggered did did you not feel heard are you afraid that you're not going to get your way as you're talking like, so what is your thought, but what are you thinking and feeling behind what, what emotional reaction you're having yourself as you're giving a share? Because, you know, sometimes someone's not really listening to you. They're blowing you off and you start to get really angry. Understand what that is. And now, now your line is, hey, you know, I'm, I, I feel like you're not really listening to me. Just call it right out in a calm voice. And find out maybe they're not interested. Maybe they're not in the mood for the conversation. Maybe they don't really understand what you're talking about. And now you're what you're doing is you're getting underneath the current of the words to the feelings and the disconnect and trying to sort out where there's disagreement or where there's a lack of connection. And you're working for the connectivity first and then the substance, the content on top of that. And none of this works if you're not authentic with your feelings. People can tell if you're not really listening or you're not telling the truth or you're not being honest about what you want to share. So having your own awarenesses of what you're feeling and being willing to share in simple language, like, hey, I'm not really comfortable with this. I'm not, I don't think you're listening to me. Am I reading that correctly? You know, um, and I give you other examples here. I'm not sure what to say. I'm surprised to hear you say that. Those, those, this kind of language is really important as, as the weavers of the separation, right? You want to, you want to go for connection and communication, and also some comfort level in a conversation. So, talking in this way as the current, addressing the undercurrent is really important. So, pausing is a, a great way um, to do that. The next one is to clarify. Now, clarification is, is something that I learned in mediation, too, because oftentimes when we're disagreeing, I did the mediation training years ago, but I remember very clearly a picture that was put, a drawing that was made on a newsprint where there's a frame 
and there's a mountain and a sun and there's a little circle in the middle of it, which is the amount of that picture that one person sees. And, and then what you want to work for in a conversation is letting the other person and you see a much bigger picture. So you get a fuller story about what's really going on. And so when you're listening to a conversation, clarification goes two ways. So you need to be clear and give all the details that you possibly can that you think are relevant for the other person. Similarly, when you're listening, let the other person paint a whole picture for you. And if you're not feeling like you have the whole picture, it's your job to ask questions about the missing details to get clarity. Let's like to see the leaf. I picked this picture because you can see the actual droplets on the leaf. You want to see every single droplet in order to you can you have the same picture that the other person has, and you're bringing that you know you're bringing that um, like a synchronicity and you're the the same foundation of information and knowledge and experience into the conversation. So clarifying is about asking questions, stopping and asking questions like, what did you mean by that? What are you referring to? How is that connected to this thing? I'm not really sure I understand. Um, why is this important to you? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not understanding why you, why this is, uh, why, why this is, um, why you're sharing this with me. Um, you also, clarification also um, pairs with assuming things. And that's another point that I'll get to get to later, but catch any assumptions you make when drill down, when you hear general statements, like somebody will make it, oh, all liberals are this way. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's some clarification that needs there. There's certain things that people are that that somebody wants to share with you that somebody really thinking and feeling, but they're glossing over it in some really kind of um, gross generalization that is not giving you any information about what they really think or feel. And this is particularly important when you have just any conversations that involve religion, politics, and family. Um, you know, people tend to make really general statements or accusations, and you want to understand what specifically they've observed or they feel that made them, but what they, what they specifically observed or experienced or put together in their own belief system that made them say that. That's something that you want to find out in a conversation. Not everybody wants to talk about it. That's why they don't they don't, they don't share it to begin with. But this clarification piece is, is really about your invitation and somewhat responsibility to drill down with questions. And then also with clarification, I have a couple of things. Refrain from filling in the blanks yourself. If you're not sure about what someone's saying, the mind wants to paint a picture and you're going to fill in the blanks mentally, even if you don't really know what the if that's what the other person thinks. So you want to refrain from doing that and making that jump to conclusions or that assumption a question. Resist the urge to agree with things out of kindness or charity or keeping things easy. You know, go for the piece of a conversation that may be uncomfortable. If someone says, oh, you know how I feel. And I know you, I know you feel the same way about this. So let's, you know, maybe you don't, but don't let that other person to sort of gloss over your own your own feelings if you feel that that it's going to take the conversation in, um, in a direction where you're not going to be in alignment with with them in a way because they're making an assumption about you so that's another way that you can clarify no actually I hear what you're saying but but to be honest I don't really agree with you that's okay but let's you know move on so you always want to you know Put your points of clarification down and make sure you're understanding what the other person is saying. The other thing with clarification is to like refrain from being, bringing up the past. And this is a point that, that belongs in several other of my tools and tips, but refrain from bringing up the past. Like you can say, uh, and that's, that comes back to the trigger words too, like you did this before and and so now you're going to do this or uh, you always have done this and so i'm just this is the way you were where you're bringing up the past and you're not letting the person um you're not allowing for the, the, uh, a clarity in the present moment about what's really going on so uh, other people do that they say well you know i know that you like to do that i know you i know you do, 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 do this and i know you did i know you like to uh uh you know uh, I can't think of an example, but maybe somebody's telling you about something you used to do that you no longer do, and they're bringing up the past and assuming they know exactly your habits and behaviors because it's repetitive to them, and they they put you in that 
and, and and you can clarify by saying yes i understand what you're saying but you know what um i actually don't do that anymore or i'm not i, I i've shifted and i'm not in that place any longer so these are all aspects of um, clarification. Um, number five is about um, finding common values. And this is one of the most important uh, intentions for, converse, for conversations that involve um, friction. Like if you know you're gonna talk to some, some of your relatives may be Democrats, some of your relatives may be Republicans, and there's absolute disagreement and friction when politics comes up. Same thing with religion or same thing with um, feelings about your neighbors uh, or any, any major conflict. One of the ways to address these intense disagreements with other people um, if you want to maintain a relationship with them or develop a relationship with them is to have the intention to find common values. And to find common values, you're going to avoid getting into disagreements about details and logic. You're not going to try to persuade somebody right off the bat about your point of view and if their facts are wrong. You're not going to bicker over events or things in the past that are in the past. Um, you're not going to trust that you remember everything exactly because you don't. We don't. So you're not going to bring up, you know, from your memory, oh, this, this, and this, this is how I remember it, because it could be flawed. Instead, what you're going to do is to shift your focus to what the other person cares about and why they care about it and find what you can both agree about or, or what you can agree on and find feelings and emotions that you share. It could be something really simple, like you both love dogs. And you both love having cats around because you can, you know, you, 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 you appreciate the nature of a cat. That's the, that's a, that's sort of the fertile ground for building more and more connections. So stay away from the details, stay away from events or things or the bickering, the argument, the accusations, the reasoning that you don't agree with. Find common values, foster connection with the things that you can, you, you, you share in common. And even if, um, you know, even if there's family conflicts, people do want to have love themselves. They want to find love. They want to be loved. There's, you can talk about that even if they don't feel it. And this is what sort of helps move a conversation along and builds your relationships um, from places of intense disagreement on the surface logic of things. The next point, number six, is to validate. And validating um, creates respect, as I have here. Validating is an important way of honoring the other person's uh, beliefs and systems, even if you don't agree with them. So you, and you're also going to help develop trust in a relationship if you can just say, yes, I, I understand that you feel that way. I, I don't necessarily agree, but I see how you've come to that conclusion. So you're validating another feelings and viewpoints. It's the first way to develop trust um, with, a, with another person and letting them know that you don't have them in a box, they're not in a frame, that you're giving them by validating what they're saying, even though you're not agreeing, you're giving them a little bit of space, airspace, to be a bubble unto themselves that you see and you are willing to, um, they're willing to accept. And then when you validate, you also don't want to just lie about what you don't believe. You want to tell the truth about your viewpoint. You want to assure the other person and you're not looking for agreement, but you're just accepting and validating what they said. Let the other person know you're okay to have that viewpoint. I'm totally fine. And believe that because this is the way, if you don't believe this, don't say it, but understand that if you want to develop a relationship and elevate a conversation, this piece of validation is very important for you to embrace as as one person talking to another person one heart connecting with another part it's okay to be uncomfortable with all this stuff but it's again it's like a muscle you need to develop make space for yourself to say hey i'm uncomfortable validate because i don't really agree but i love this person and i want to love this person and i and i want and this step is going to help me get to the next step because it will and this little, um, uh, I want to share of this, um, this graphic. It's not from me. It's from an organization called Smart Politics. And it, Smart Politics is, 
teaches about how to have meaningful relationships when there's big political divides between people. So we've covered some of these ask, list, trust, but the validate piece is about acknowledging the legitimacy of other people's feelings and beliefs. It's essential for you to do that. Accept their experience. You've not lived the life that they've lived. You've not experienced everything that they've experienced and you're not wired the way they are either. So acceptance gives them, hey, I see you, it's okay. And, and then agree wherever you can. And then beyond that, even describe a time when you felt the same way they did about an issue. Because they're, again, this is looking for points of connection. So validation has several components, not only listening and accepting, but maybe even verbally agreeing and also sharing, finding a time or describing a time when you felt the same way the other person did. And now we move to acceptance. One thing leads to another. So you're accepting another person. is It's hard sometimes because you don't agree, you're angry, you have a history with them, things are just not comfortable. But your job in terms of the awareness you need to have in a conversation is to identify what it is that bothers you. Identify the obstacles to your willingness to accept. And then at the same time you're trying to figure that out, listen to the other party to make sure you truly hear what is going on on the other side. What is their pain? What is their resistance? Like to see people in a new way, see them through their pain, see them through their agitation, see them through their anger that may not be just directed at you, but how are they processing things? How What's motivating them to behave in this way? If you accept them for who they are, then you can start to see them in a different way. And then here's the next piece, which I really love about this principle of accepting. Identify what it is you feel that you have to give up. Because that sometimes is the resistance we have for accepting. You don't have to give up your power. You don't have to give up your honor. You don't have to give up who you, how you think. But you have to give up your current understanding of the other person in order to accept who they are. So that means sort of wiping the slate clean of, all, of, of how you used to see them and making space and room for a current understanding of this person who, with whom you're talking, accept wholly and fully and authentically who they are, and it will shift you. And as it shifts you, it will shift them too. And it takes a lot of the force energy, that hot energy out of the conversation. Next, next point is to share personal stories. This is pretty simple. I don't have too much content about this. Sharing builds trust and connection, and it's a key to elevating the conversation. Why is it a key to elevating the conversation? Because personal stories dampen defensiveness. If you're sharing something that happened to you that someone else can connect with from a feeling point of view or from an attitudinal point of view, it's going to mitigate the differences and it provides support and provides a, a, a show of shared value. You're not telling somebody, you're showing them, hey, I understand, I feel the same way you did. Here's what happened to me years ago, and this is how I handle it, so I see where you're coming from here. And that's a great bond builder. And, and you, you share a story without trying to make a point, like, see, I did it differently. No, no negativity, no accusations, no judgment, just a story that connects you human to human on a, on a feeling, on a feeling level, feelings and emotions that you shared in common around something that happened to you. It's humanizing you and it's letting them know you see them as a human being as well. The next word, next one is do not assume. I could do a whole you know, semester on, on, on assuming. So if you break out the word assume, it makes an ass of you and me, which is exactly what happens when you make too many assumptions. So in my, um, in, in here I say we all filter information according to our patterns and beliefs. And even if we grew up in the same household, we have different patterns and beliefs and we filter information completely differently. Why? Because we're all wired differently. 
And the mind craves understanding, as I mentioned before, when you somebody's telling you a story or giving you details and you can't put all the pieces together, you're gonna it's oftentimes we're gonna try to fill in the puzzle piece ourselves because we want consistency and coherence in the story. And instead of asking and saying, Well, what is the connection here? You're gonna assume that you know, or you're gonna make something up and then let them continue their story. Or you're gonna to jump to a conclusion about what they're saying because they haven't told you what their conclusion is. And this is where your understanding of how your own mind works and what you wanna get out of the conversation is the great intervener, right? Then you, you can know that I need to ask a question here. I need to make sure I'm understanding what they're saying. And I realize, I assume that they know, I'm, I'm assuming that, that they know, that they're assuming that I know who that other person is. I don't know who that other person is. What are they talking about? Or well, they're assuming I know that this event happened and I don't really know what went down. They need to tell me this. So assuming, do not assume making an ass of you and me is about you making sure you're clear on the details and you're clear on what the other person wants you to know so that you can track the conversation. When you ask a question, you know, the other person's listening, you're asking for clarification and you're not allowing yourself to make an assumption. And the assumption piece is so subtle. We do this all the time and it's, I, I, you know, it's be a great practice for you in your next conversation to track yourself to see, am I assuming I know something and I really don't? And I promise you, if you do catch yourself in that and you ask a clarifying question, you will be so surprised at what you hear back because you may have been thinking down a completely different path than the other person. When you ask this question based on what they are asking you to assume, you have a whole different understanding. And, and then the point here is who context matters all the time. And what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that the details and the circumstances of a situation are everything. And a lot of times in a conversation, people are sharing things with you and surprise, they're not giving you all the context that you really need to hear. They're not telling you all the details. Maybe they want you to, 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 to come to the same conclusion that they do. But if you're missing details and you feel like you're missing details, you need to ask a question and get more context and, and ask them for ask them for the details and ask them to maybe maybe they haven't even framed the circumstances for you at the get-go so that that maybe you need to ask them to do that because context often isn't known and if it's the foundation for why someone's telling you this what brought them to the conclusion and then if they're triggered about it what is seemingly so upsetting about this i don't don't assume what they're feeling just don't just comment based on your observations if this seems to upset you why what brought you to this conclusion? These are all the things that you need to ask about because you may assume that this person just got upset about something but not know particularly what it was that triggered them. Okay, the last one, um, and I, Julie, how am I doing for time? Okay, the last one um, is to seek to understand and create comfort. And even though that might not be your intention, in a conversation, seeking to understand and create comfort. In order to elevate a conversation, if you have that as um, a, a basic, like a, a basic understanding, or if you have that as a willingness, especially if you're in like a mediation situation, like, and then you're going into mediation with somebody and you're really uncomfortable because clearly you're in mediation because there's something that needs to be resolved that's bothering both you and the other person. But if you go in there seeking to understand and create comfort, and that's one of your overarching umbrella things, then you're going to walk, you're going to speak differently. You're going to listen a little harder and you're going to avoid harsh words and harsh language. Even if the other person is coming at you with harsh language, that's going to tell you everything about the other person and who they are. And you don't have to engage in their, in their swirl. Right. We, we all have our own swirls. And the point of elevating a conversation is to recognize those swirls and not let yourself get sucked into it. If someone's a tornado coming at you, you, do, you want to step aside and let the tornado go by because you don't want to get caught up in the swirl. Right. You don't want to do that because you're going to get hurt.
and nothing's going to get resolved. You're just going to create a bigger mess. So in seeking to understand, I just drew a little diagram because I thought this is what often happens in conversation. Person one, this is, this is the person one is the first line is that person one says A and they mean B. And you're person two and you hear person A say what they say and you assume that they mean C. And so automatically you're not on the same page. You're not together. One simple statement could could divide the conversation. And it's because you assume something and you, and, and you didn't ask a question. You don't really know what their emotional reaction is. You don't really know what the details are, but you made an assumption. And this is virtually what happens in a conversation. Instead of being on the same line, you've now diverged. And the, it's only going to get more divergent from there as time goes on. So this is the purpose and the, and, and, um, the point of um, seeking to understand. So here's a, just a living example for me. I, I was working with a woman and she told, you know, she said, Sally texted you three times with a question. She didn't tell me why she's telling me this. Oops, so sorry. So she texted me with a question and, you, and I didn't know this, but I felt really bad. Like, oh my God, I'm not doing something. I didn't respond. I'm being chided because I didn't, I, I, you know, the text you're supposed to respond to right away. And I did not. Well, the truth of it was that Sally texted me three times. It's true. I didn't see that. I didn't see the text. And Sally lives six hours away from me in, in the East Coast, and she's ready to go to bed and wants an answer. So the person I'm speaking with could have told me, hey, you need to get back to Sally because she needs to go to bed. And she wants to hear back from her question that she texted you. Can you get to the text? That's not what I was told. I had no context. I just got told Sally texted you three times. You know, what do you do with that? And this is this is why it's important to ask for context. Why is somebody telling me this? What do you mean by that? Am I supposed to do something? Instead of me, and I could, you can easily get defensive when somebody says something like that to you. And I, I remember the moment when a whole range of feelings went through me, like, why am I being told this? What am I supposed to do? Because I tend to be a little hard on myself, my first reaction was to blame myself and think I did something terribly wrong and to apologize, right? And I ended up, that was not correct. When I went to, why did you tell me this? Then I got the context and now I was like, oh, wow, sorry, I missed that email. Let me get to her right away. You know, that's, that's the end of it. So you can, you can, you know, nip, nip things in the bud simply by asking questions like, why are you telling me this? What do you mean by this? What do you want me to do? How did you come to that conclusion? Those kinds of things to make sure that from a logic standpoint, you guys are on the same page as you navigate through your conversation. And it's fair and appropriate for you to ask why you were told something. This could be in a work situation too. Your boss tells you something like, well, why, why are you telling me this? What do you, what is it that you want me to do that, you know, that, that, that I'm not quite clear on that. So you're navigating through the conversation and not making, putting everything on yourself to figure out and assume and handle if you're not completely sure of the details. And I promise you, as communicators, most of us are really bad. We don't give enough context. We don't give enough detail. We don't give our reasoning. We tend to give orders, not the why something should happen, not the impact something should happen. So we can, you know, elevate the conversation and it's by going down into the whys, the hows, what do you mean? Um, and in order to keep keep um, from the bickering, accusations, frustrations, disgust, resentment, all those things that that keep us on a low low level and low vibration in our relationships. Um, so I mean, I don't I don't need to read the slide, but you can you'll get this. Um, and it's all about the meaning, like why, what are, uh, what meaning do other people ascribe to events or behavior that's different from what you do? You need, we need to get at these things through conversation, through questioning, so that we understand more deeply, seek to understand. Understanding brings us closer to being on the same wavelength, the same page, common ground, finding shared values. And from there, you can build a more fruitful, beneficial, helpful, loving, compassionate, relationship that um that has less uh less also opportunity for resentment because you're learning you're learning how to connect with people in a way that fosters um understanding unified understanding and you know mutual respect without also needing to agree okay um
let me see i have one more slide here yes um and this is the about this is the trust pyramid again not my graphic this comes from smart politics but the comfort and connection are the lowest part of the trust pyramid but if you want to continue you keep building trust with people and with loved ones you start with the comfort piece you start with not getting not letting yourself get triggered with asking for clarification you're building the connections through shared values, seeking to understand that's the comprehension piece. And then you build up to, with your deeper understanding and your deeper awareness, you can have more compassion for the way someone else has is behaving because of their experience, the struggles they've had, the situation they're in. You learn about that because they'll eventually share that. And now you have credibility and authenticity, and then you have more trust with that person. Okay, and on that note, I conclude my Elevate the Conversation presentation. Um, um, thank you so much for listening. I hope this was helpful and um, that you learned something. I do have uh, the slide presentation that you will receive and also a handout sheet that has the 10 points with the, with the icons that I put on to help you remember what I meant uh, with, each, with each tool and tip. So here's the point where we have about five minutes where we can have some questions. I did see some people put things in the chat. And also, if anyone wants to ask a live question, we can do that. And so um, uh, back in the beginning, Paula, you were talking about, um, you know, seeking clarity on um, what somebody is meaning. And one person asked, what if the other person says they don't know why? Um, they're talking about something or they're not sure where they're going on the conversation. How do you handle that? That's a great, that's a great question. And um, I remember a, a similar question I asked a psychiatrist uh, in a certain context. And the response from the psychiatrist was make something up. If you don't, if you're not really sure, make something up because it's a good chance it's going to be close to the truth. So if somebody doesn't know why they're rambling on and on and on, well, wait a minute, why are you telling me this? Well, I'm not really sure. Well, you know, make make something up. And what, what that's going to trigger is some instinct from inside. Instead of being in their logical mind, they're going to going to give you something instinctual and it will be close to the truth. Thank you, Paula. And another person asked, um, it was around the same time when you were speaking. So do you interrupt if they say something you might get stuck on? And she's saying, for me, that would be an intervention. But for another, it might be considered rude. So it's kind of inserting yourself in. If you're stuck on something you don't understand, should you do that? Or should you wait and seek deeper clarity is kind of where I think we were in the slideshow. Yeah, that's a that's a, a also an important point, and you know timing is everything. And I think you have, I, I think in that instance, yes, you want to get your question in if you're stuck on something, and um, you don't also want to interrupt. Yes, some people might find that rude, so um, you want to find your moment to say, hey, before you go, before you keep going on, um, I, I wanted, I wondered if I could ask a question. There's something you said that I'm not really clear about, and I feel it's important for, for, for I, I need some clarity on it before we go on. So you have, you're injecting yourself at a certain place, but you're asking permission to inject yourself for the purpose of gaining clarity about something that was said. And you can also apologize, say, hey, I'm sorry, but I, I don't understand something. Can I ask a question right now? And if the person says no, then hold your question, whatever. But it, it, it's it, the, the, the permission structure is there kind of like, you know, you want permission to pick the flower from the ground. You want permission to ask a question. And usually somebody will say, oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Thank you, Paula. And in the section where you were talking about um, you don't have to agree with someone so they'll like you or whatnot. One person had the comment uh, resisting the urge to people, please, is probably the hardest one for me. Any further thoughts on that? 
Absolutely. Um, especially, I mean, I guess, especially for, for women, women, I'm finding like, I'm, I was born and raised a people pleaser. And a lot of the work that I did was about, you know, people pleasing. And the, the thing is that you have to develop the muscle, the muscle to be uh, authentic with yourself and not be embarrassed about it, not be shy about, you know, stating what you really feel um, in polite ways. But um, if you don't agree with somebody, it's, you know, there, there's no stigma about not agreeing with somebody. And maybe in our own minds, we think there's a stigma or that we're going to incite some, you know, disastrous reaction if we say that we don't agree. But it's actually, if you think about it, it's actually like, you know, building out the petals of the flower. If you think about yourself as a flower, somebody may see you as a bud and this is who you are. But as you begin to share, like with what you agree and don't agree with or what your perceptions are, people are going to see you in a bigger way and, and allow you some some space. And you don't have to be mean about not agreeing, but just say, wow, you know, I'm, I, I just want you to know I, I don't agree with you there. And, um, you know, it's OK. Remember, I said, wrote in the slide, I don't agree with you. It's OK with me that I don't agree with you. I hope it's OK with you. And now you're not not leaving any room for incitement or, or, or bad feelings. And the other thing is, if you do find that someone else is hurt by the fact that you don't agree with them, that tells you something about their vulnerability and their relative immaturity or emotional immaturity and that's not a good thing or a bad thing it just is and you got to let that let that be let that sit thanks paula and then in the section where you were talking about how to make connection someone asked what if you don't have a shared experience to connect with a particular issue that was in the section where you're saying you can try to connect by share by share by sharing a personal story so what if you don't have something for that instance? Um, I would say that if they're talking about some emotional reaction to something, what you would want to do is, is try to, sh is to share a story where you had a similar emotional reaction or you reacted in a similar way. The circumstance or the context could be completely different. But we're all emotional beings and, you know, we, we probably have a similar a similar feeling. Now, if someone says to you, you know, I really wanted to kill that person, I was so angry, and you can't relate to that, you can just share like, well, you know, I did get really angry at so and so, not that I wanted to, you know, harm them, but I do understand, and you're just basically saying, I understand what intense anger is. So it's not about sharing a story that's exactly like theirs, but, but connecting on the feelings that they had. Thank you so much, Paula. We got to every question in the chat, and I would like to thank everyone for being here today. And I would like everyone to give a big Zoom appreciation for Paula. Yes, Yay, Paula, what a wonderful presentation. And we will be sending out those slides and a one sheet to cover every comment, every point of the 10 points on one page that you could print out or post it somewhere, or, you know, Make it the desktop on your computer if you want to consider these more. I have put the survey link again in the chat. So please do take a minute before you leave to click in on that and start filling out our survey. And a reminder, our next brown bag is going to be June 20th. Arliss Dudley Cash speaking on the topic, Unlocking Effective Communication Through Disc Personality Tap types. And that link is also in the chat. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And we will see you next time. Aloha. Thank you.